Hello, hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today at Coffee and Collaboration. Um, we are so glad that you're here. We have a great crowd already, and um, I see that more are hopping on, so I'm so glad to see so many faces. This is going to be a great presentation today, and we're just so glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Katrina Huff Sutler. I am the president of Lifestep Publications Council, and uh, I'm happy to be hosting this. <laughs> We're so glad that you guys are on here and, and hope you enjoy it. If anyone wants to leave early during the presentation, please know this will be on YouTube later on today, so you can catch up if you miss anything or if you had to take a call. I'm going to start by kicking this over to Stacy for a minute. Stacy Fox is our executive director of LPC and let her give a little update on some LPC news and going on. And then um, I'll come back and get us kicked off with who you really came to see today. Stacy, do you have anything to say today? I do. Thank you, Katrina. Um, it's great to see everybody. Happy 2024, our first um, coffee and collaboration of 2024. So it's good to see such a great crowd on today. Uh, next week, um, February 1st, um, for those of you that are going to be at the NCBA convention, we will have our luncheon. Um, you have probably seen information come through on tickets to that luncheon. They are $50 each. If you have not uh, purchased your ticket yet, there is still time, and we would love to have you join us next week. We are also going to have our drawdown, uh, which is uh, basically a, a raffle that we will sell tickets for on site. Um, we've got some great items already so far that I wanted to just share a couple with you. Um, the Livestock Marketing Association has donated um, an auctioneer Napa Cabernet Sauvignon and two stemless LMA, LMA wine glasses. Uh, the American Hereford Association has donated a $250 gift card to the Doe Hook. Um, Livestock Advertising Network has donated a 2024 Ag Media Summit registration. Uh, Certified Angus Beef has uh, donated a double live edge charcuterie board, which is really beautiful. Um, she, Morgan's going to have it there on site. It's just, it, I looked at it online. It's beautiful. And Cultivate Agency has donated a hotel gift card. And we've got more items coming in. So if you would love to donate an item, we would uh, welcome that. This is one of the fundraisers that LPC does throughout the year. And so if you have any items that you would like to donate and then uh, be ready to purchase those um, drawdown tickets on site and we'll have a good time. We've had, got some award winners um, to recognize and announce at that time as well. And just a great time to get in person. You know, we see each other virtually a lot. So we really hope that you can all join us there um, in person if you're um, gonna be at the NCBA convention in Orlando. But let me know if you have any questions. The exact room is escaping me right now, um, but we will send everybody who's purchased a ticket some details, kind of a no before you go email with all of the details <laughs> on exactly when and where so we're looking forward to seeing you all there. Also, we have some exciting news uh, related to a membership um, system. So be on the lookout for some emails where you will be able to go in and set up your new online profile for your membership. So exciting stuff coming from LPC. And if you need anything, I'm here. I have been out of the country for a couple of weeks. So digging back through my emails, really grateful for everyone's um, patience while I was gone. Uh, but let me know if you need anything and uh, looking forward to seeing many of you next week. Thank you, Katrina. Thanks so much, Stacey. And I just want to say again, thank you to everyone who donated. Those are some awesome items. I'm going to be buying a whole lot of tickets, hoping I win one. Um, as a reminder, we you can cash to buy these raffle tickets at NCBA, or you can invoice you if you're like me and often are not carrying your cash with you. We will take your money in any way you'd like to and hopefully give you some really cool prizes in the in the process. I see some folks on here uh, that were at last year's event and won some of those prizes. And and hope you'll all have great luck this year. It's my pleasure, though, now to move on to introduce uh, Eric Grant. Is not only my boss, but someone I've met to work for a really long time and had a chance to work with in various capacities over the years. And um, gosh, I just can't think of a better storyteller in our industry than Eric Grant. And one thing that I really admire about Eric is he's someone who's just one of the best writers i know but he has used those communication skills to wear so many different hats in our industry and he has evolved better than anyone i can i can think of and, and using those 
in new and exciting ways and has just served our industry so well for the year. He's going to talk to us today about finally getting over that block to write a book. And I think most writers um, want to write a book at some point, even if you're not necessarily authors by trade, you may be journalists, you may be PR folks, you may be something else. You probably want to write a book. And, and Eric was one of those folks. And, and he's going to talk a little bit about finding those stories within you and how he overcame a block that lasted more than three decades. Um, additionally, and I'm going to let uh, Eric kind of give you his background and anything he wants to say at the beginning of this, but additionally, um, he let us know this morning that he is very generously giving his LPC friends a discount code. If anyone is interested in the book he's going to talk about today, they can get $50 off. So at the end of this, um, I will put that code and link up in the chat. I would encourage you guys, if you have questions as you go, to type those in the chat if you want to have them go to everyone. That is great. If you want to be a little more private and not have your shown, you're welcome to just send those in a DM to me through the chat, and I'll be happy to read those for you. Additionally, at the end, if you'd like to just say your question out loud, that's an option too. So Eric's going to leave a few minutes at the end of his presentation for any questions you may have about the book writing process or, or anything he mentions today. So without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to him. And uh, again, just uh, thanks so much for being here for all of you. Thank you, Katrina. Appreciate it. it uh, it's unbelievable that how I remember when uh, I think it was Jennifer Scheich reached out to me in mid-December to do this session. And she said it'd be January 24th. Uh, man, that's a long way off. Um, but I think the lesson of that uh, is that time goes by very fast. And if you've got a book inside you, you better take advantage of that time and, and, and start working on it. So um, I've got a little... Uh, PowerPoint that I pulled together um, with some some thoughts on what I went through to finally get mine done. And uh, hopefully there's some information in there that you can use. And um, I plan to talk for about 15 minutes and then just uh, open it up for conversation. I think that's probably the most beneficial part of these kinds of sessions. But let me uh, get my screen shared here. Okay, can you see that? Everybody hear me all right? Yes, we can see and hear you. Okay, so there's my contact information and uh, grant company websites on there, my email address. If you need to reach out to me, feel free to, to, to email anytime. And then the, the book website is just uh, www.holliswilliford.com. Again, appreciate the Livestock Publications uh, Council for this opportunity. I've been a member, I think, since 1990, so it's an organization that's really helped shape my career. Also, want to thank Novel Designs for uh, sponsoring these. It's uh, really good that there are companies that step up and support these kinds of endeavors. Um, so this is the book um, that we finally got done, a couple shots of it. <clears throat> it's Hollis Williford, The Crossing at the River. Um, it's a uh, coffee table book about a Western artist who passed away in 2007 and uh, finally started writing it in uh, 2021, and it took about two years um, for us to get it uh, pulled together and printed and out the door and available for the, for the public. Um, it contains about 400 uh, photos um, of his work um, from various sources. Uh, when I initially sat down to write the manuscript i didn't know whether i'd have access to any photos or at all or even support or or interest from the family um, but all of those things uh, turned out and it was a real blessing to do this and i should say that doing this project was probably the most enjoyable thing i've ever done in my life and and if you do have a book in your cell inside and you want to get it done um you know there there are frustrating days ahead but also uh blissful days ahead as, as well um this is a photo I took in Norway, and I think it best kind of exemplifies what it's like to take that first step. Um, so there's really not any pathway that I can give you or show you um, to get from that moment of inspiration of wanting to write a book to getting to the point where you bring it to conclusion. You've got to find your path. And um, I think for many, many years, I confused my own inspiration um, and motivation for wanting to do it with execution. And I think if there's one thing that I can tell you today, it's all about the execution and getting past the inspiration and finding that 
that that trail through the woods to get to where you need to be with it and it and it, it isn't going to happen unless you uh you execute and uh, uh but once you start to execute the thing kind of has its own momentum and it kind of carries you along and it's a, it's an amazing creative process once you take that first step so i wanted to step back a little bit and talk about where all this came from um so I bought a house in Denver in 1992, in Northwest Denver, and was looking for things to decorate it with. And there was this little antique store. It's now a, a women's boutique clothing store in Northwest Denver. It was an antique store at the time. But uh, I saw it, and I drove by it, parked, went, uh, went in, and uh, thought, well, man, I, there's got to be something in there that I could put in my house. Um, and uh, hanging on the wall directly behind the cash register was this little etching um, of the wagon train. Well, that's pretty cool. So I, I bought it and uh, took it home and hung it on my wall and didn't think about it too much. Um, a couple months later, I thought, gosh, I wonder if that artist is still alive um, and if there's any more work like that out there. So I this is before the Internet. So I called around, called some art galleries, called information. You know, some of you probably remember information. Um, and uh, found out that this guy, Hollis Williford, a Western artist, Hollis Williford, um, lived in Loveland, Colorado, which was just about 40 miles north of where I was living. So I called him, um, and he invited me to come up that night, and so I hopped in the car and headed that way. Um, and so when I uh, when I got there, I pulled in the driveway and uh, wasn't sure if I was in the right place or not, but you see the uh, the little doorway with the wagon wheel window. Um, I walked over there just to kind of see if that was the right door I needed to go in. And through the window, I could see the uh, sculpture on the left, just standing there in the studio. And I thought, oh boy, um, this guy's a lot more than just an etcher. And I found out uh, that Hollis Williford, as I became to know him, was really probably not probably was one of the most important western artists of the last 25 30 years of the or for, for, for basically span from about 1980 to about 2007 when he passed away the the middle panel shows the awards that he received from the national cowboy and western heritage museum and he's one of just a handful of artists over the last 50 years that's that's received the highest level of achievement uh the, the called the pre to west purchase award and the uh the Bron uh, the monument that he's working on, on the left actually stands at the entryway of the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum now. So if you're ever down there in Oklahoma City, that's the first thing that you see. So he he was a major uh, artist uh, and um, had an, an, an incredible impact on a lot of artists, but also on the art community. Um, so the next day I went home and and I and I wrote this letter to him, just a thank you letter. And I'm I'm not somebody who typically writes lengthy thank you letters, but I thought felt kind of inspired by what I had seen. And I and I wrote the thing and and sent it off to him. And a couple of weeks later, um, I called him back and he said, you know, I got your letter. Um, I want you to come back up because I'd like you to talk to you about writing my biography. Um, and this was right after Thanksgiving, 1992. So things were starting to move pretty quick. And um, I guess the little saying here, little things matter. You know, sometimes these little thank you notes can lead you in a lot of life changing areas if you're if you're if you're open to the spirit. Um, so I went up and we discussed it. And um, Hollis and I became very good friends. And I spent the next six years interviewing him and spending a lot of time with him. Um, he actually encouraged me to become a freelance writer and photographer, which I did about six months after I met him. And I did that for about 15 years. Um, but so he had an amazing impact on me. But the uh, at the time, I was in my late 20s and and I can't I don't really have any excuse for it, but I just could not get the thing written. And I think a big part of it was that he just intimidated me. And everything that I wrote just did not match up to the the the, the person I was that I knew. Um, so it kind of fizzled and then it just died and that was the end of it. So in 2020, 2021, um, there was a lot of destruction of public art. And I remember I was in bed one night and it was dark and it was about 3 a.m. And I had just seen some video footage of, uh, of a statue of uh, Ulysses S. Grant being dragged to the streets of San Francisco and being destroyed and spray paint and everything. And, and I thought, holy crap, what if they did that to Hollis's work? 
And I thought, you know what? You got to get off your butt and you got to write this story. So I uh, started gathering up all my interview notes and I had an old, actually had an old computer with a lot of the transcripts on it that were easily transferable into a, a modern word format and uh, started getting ready to do it. And I think one of the things that held me up was the fact that everything I'd read as far as art books were concerned were were just these huge tomes, <laughs> thousands and thousands of words by very knowledgeable people about art, you know, faculty members on university uh, campuses and things like, like I can't write that. And I recognize that in myself. Um, and then I listened to this audio book by Larry McMurtry, and he had written this beautiful biography about Custer in the short form. And it was basically just a collection of really short essays. And I thought, man, that's I can do that. Um, I can write short essays because my brain kind of shuts off when I get to about 1,200 words because I'd written for magazines for so long. And I don't have to write this the way that everybody else has written it. I can write it the way I want to write it. And it was very liberating. And I think that's something that all of you should know, that don't let the rules of 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 book writing get in the way right you write the rules this is your book do it the way you want it so i uh i kind of unlocked the key there at that point for myself and then um crystal albers who i've worked with now for 15 years we were sitting in her office one day and i'm like you know gosh you know i'm still a little bit stuck and she always brings clarity. She brings clarity to our business and the things that we do, the projects we do. And she said, well, you know, what, what did Hollis want from the book? And I think it comes down to three things. One was that he wanted people to know that he didn't waste his life, that all of his efforts were for the positive, and that any barefoot kid could walk into a museum and be inspired by his work. And it kind of right there, okay, that's, that's the key. So I had the motivation um, clarified in my mind. And I loaded everything up in my car, and I live north of Kansas City in St. Joseph, and I headed to Oklahoma City. And um, I'm like, I'm not coming back until I have a draft written. And the reason I went to Oklahoma City was be, to be close to the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum, be close to his work. And they also had a great archival department where I could get information and things. And it turned out the, the Williford family had donated... Um, a lot of pictures of Hollis, uh, and you know, it was just like everything I was writing about, I was finding visually at the museum. And it was just, it was really just uh, serendipity. But, but I, I, I got in myself into a pattern where I would get up about four a.m. in the morning when I'm really the best at writing, and I wrote till ten a.m. and I would write four to 5,000 words in those six hours, just write just as fast as I possibly could. And uh, then midday, I would head to the museum and meet with the archivist and go through things and kind of get my inspiration for the next day. But 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 I write fast. I don't always write well. But the goal was to get to here, which by the end of that week or week and a half, whatever it was that I was down there, I actually had about 30,000 words <laughs> written. And... Um, you know, and that was where it all really started. Um, but it, it was such a relief to get that, those words finally written. And, um, and I think that should be the goal for all of you who are considering writing a book, just write fast, get it done. Um, and then, and then start to hone in on it and, and uh, chisel away with your editing. Um, at the time that I wrote the book, I wasn't sure if Hollis's family was still around, um, and what level of support they would they would have for the book. Um, but working from the left to right uh, is Ronnie Williford, his younger brother, and Ronnie uh, was an animator with Walt Disney. He's a fine artist in his own right. He's he's a really was really really great help on this and very supportive. He was the first person I sent the manuscript to. Is Hollis's sister Melba is in the middle. Um, and uh, his son, Justin, is on the right. And then on the far right is uh, Hollis's wife, Debbie. And everyone was behind the project. In fact, I think it helped bring them all closure uh, to his, his passing in 2007. And each of them gave me a window of perspective into each phase of his life. And that was all very, very helpful. 
And so a book is kind of a community project. Um, once you get it going, it, it, you're not on an island by yourself. You're going to need people to depend on. And a couple of other people that were very critical was this Barry Smith, who's a cinematographer, um, lifelong friend of the Willifords, um, who had the vision in the 80s to shoot these black and these beautiful black and white pictures of Hollis at work. And uh, and then Marty Asplund, who was the only photographer that that uh, Hollis trusted to shoot his work. And both of those guys um, were more than supportive of him sharing their images to make this book possible. And, um, you know, so all of a sudden we're dealing not with just words, we're also dealing with support of the family, momentum, and, and also imagery. Um, so it starts coming together. Um, and then I had a group of people, old trusted friends that I that I wanted to, to read the manuscript to challenge me on the manuscript to make it better. Uh, the guy on the right, obviously, Steve Suther, you all know him. Um, Tony Malmberg is a rancher in Oregon. And then Chuck Schroeder, who was a longtime CEO at, at National Cattlemen's and also the executive director of the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum, among many other people. Um, but they were they challenged me on the manuscript to make it better. And I think as you pull your words together, be thinking about who you want to challenge the manuscript. Then at any given time, we had probably three or four people on the grant company team who were working on this proofreading, editing, you know, all those kinds of things. It, it was such a wonderful thing to have, be able to lean on the expertise of all the folks on this team. And then we had experts on the outside too, um, including Laura Nelson and Sarah Hill. I'm not so sure if Sarah's on, on the call or not, but Sarah um, did a great job of helping us edit and proof and um, we actually had her go through and Google and fact check every every proper noun that was in the book. Said, <laughs> you know, just make sure we had the spelling right, the dates right, all those kinds of things. Um, and then we had, uh, you know, people like Megan Shepard, who was the uh, former curator of the Museum of Western Art, who brought up, you know, an art business perspective to it, and the help of the folks at the National Western or National uh, Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum that uh, helped kind of keep the boat stabilized. But there were things that I didn't think about, you know, writing this thing and where are you going to land this plane once you get the momentum going and the pages produced and all that. Never thought about the dimensions of the book and, and the kind of box you might need to ship it. It's a, a little thing, but it's a really big thing. Um, so and then how are you going to ship it? Um, how, how are you going to get it to people? How are you going to promote it? Um, one of the really big struggles we had with the book was getting the color to print right. All these kinds of things didn't even enter in your mind when I sat down to write it, but boy, did we struggle with that for, for, for probably, probably two months before we finally got the, the, the printing company to, to get to where we needed on color. And then how are you going to publicize the book? And this, these are things I never even thought about. Um, I've appeared on a number of uh, po uh, art podcasts around the country, and that's been really good for uh, promoting the book. And I think just because you wrote the book doesn't mean people are actually going to want the book, you know, so you got to keep it out in front of people as much as possible um, and keep it in a positive light in front of people so that they actually want to purchase it and give them a reason to buy it. Because you're going to have a lot of time in this thing, a lot of money tied up into it. And then, you know, integrating things like PayPal and uh, building your website to promote it so that people can find it and finding the stores where they actually can, will sell it. Um, the photo on the right is that the, the bookstore at the uh, Persimmon Hill uh, gift store at the Western Heritage, uh, Cowboy National Cowboy and Western Heritage Mo Museum, which is now carrying the book. Now I've got a couple other retail outlets who are selling it like that. Um, and uh, that's been good. Um, but things that you never even think about as you do it. And then finally, uh, a benefit that I never really even considered. Um, these are two of Hollis's works. These are uh, the two pre to West winners at the Cowboy Museum. Um, and these these works were in the basement um, for many, many years. Um, uh, they, you know, after Hollis's passing, his his work and his life had kind of lost momentum. And I'm not saying that they brought these things back up and put them on display uh, as a result of the book, but I don't think the book hurt either. And so one of the goals as I mentioned earlier, when Crystal asked me that question about, you know, what did he want to accomplish? And any, any barefoot kid could walk into a museum and be inspired by his work. Well, his work auto, all of a sudden is reappearing in institutions um, where people can see it. And the, the one on the lower right, the smaller welcome sundown, there's actually a full display showing the documents 
the business side of art, the negotiations that Hollis underwent with the museum to get that large monument installed in front of the building. And uh, I was watching one day, and I, I think there were seven people in a 30-minute span that went through and, and read all of those documents. So the book um, has had an impact, I think, in ways that I never anticipated, and, and that's been a good thing. So um, final slide here, um, cross, cross Your River, you know, the the idea of crossing a river as the title, moving into some uh, something new, finding your trail, finding your path. Um, the first one is initiate. Time clock's ticking. Just start, start writing, and and don't worry about too much what you're writing until you get to that first draft, and then and then challenge it. Follow your gut and your inspiration, but don't confuse inspiration with execution. We all have great ideas and what we want to write but ultimately you're gonna to have to execute on it. Find clarity, ask the key questions of what the book is that you wanna do and use that to guide it. Write fast. I know a lot of authors say they write slow. You know, Shelby Foote, I was reading, uh, watching a video about him the other night. He said he wrote four, four or 500 words a day for 20 years. I could never do that myself. I wouldn't have the time to do it, but, but I, I write fast and I think it's good advice to write fast as, to get it done. And they get people you trust to challenge a manuscript, but protect your voice. Your voice is important in this process too. Um, make it sound like you. Don't let somebody uh, steamroll you on, on your words. Have a plan for designing, publishing, and distributing. And then probably the really the biggest unexpected thing for me was that writing a book also kind of is a way of writing your own life story because the book becomes a really a big part of your of your life and um it becomes a narrative of how you describe yourself and how you see yourself uh, moving forward once you get it done so with that um i will uh turn off my screen here and um if you got any questions fire away Thank you so much for that eric we've got about 15 minutes left for questions and our first question or two have popped up on the screen. I'll read the first for Melissa Hart. She said, how many did you determine, or excuse me, how did you determine how many to print? And then do you have a print on demand option or will you do a second printing if you sell out? How do you work the financial end of that? Is that super? Yeah. Don't feel like you have to answer it all. Just things I've always wondered about. So yeah, well, for yeah, thank you for that question. I, 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 know, I didn't go into this thinking it was gonna be a, a commercial success. Um, my goal was to just get the book written. Um, we ran, we, we printed about a thousand, 1200 copies somewhere in that range. Um, we don't have print on demand. I'm not going to print anymore. Um, the, you know, uh, I, I think the market for this kind of book is about a thousand books. Um, what was the other part of this question? The other part is uh, how did you work the financial end of that out? And if it's too personal, don't feel like you have to answer yeah. how you make it. Uh, you know, this kind of book obviously costs, it's it's, it's pretty cost prohibitive to, to do one of them. Um, but, you know, for me, I just I just kind of wanted to, to get the thing done. Um, I, I think the most important thing is to get a manuscript for, you know, and then, and then worry about the other part of it. Um, maybe that's the wrong way to do business. But I think if you go about it by working in a budget first and saying this is all I can afford to print or et cetera, I, I think you know you get focused on the wrong things. I think the the, the primary objective should be to just getting your words on the, on the page. And then, because my original thoughts for the book was I would just put it out on the internet and let people find it there without designing it or anything, just have the manuscript out there where people could find out about Hollis. But uh, as it, as it evolved, it became much, much more of a coffee book, coffee table book um, than, than just words. Our next question comes from a familiar name, Bob Cervera asks uh, if there are any benefits to a project and then going back to it after it's had time to bake in your mind for a bit. Well, I have 30 years to think about it. Um, there's a million things I would do differently about the book. Um, but at some point you just got to execute it and put it to bed, you know, move, move, move past it. Absolutely. I really loved what you said about inspiration uh, versus execution. I made a few notes on that. Great, great advice for all of us writers. 
I did mention at the beginning of this presentation that Eric has offered a $50 discount to any of his LPC friends on who are interested in buying the book. Um, just as a you know, thank you for, for being a part of this industry. I put that information in the chat if you are interested in taking advantage of that. Does anyone else have any questions about the book process? Oh, another one just popped up as I asked. Any advice on finding a publisher, Bev asked? No, I don't. Um, I, uh, you know, obviously we did the self-published route, um, but in some regards, I think it was a legitimate kind of publishing process because because we're involved in communications and we have um, so many people who are, are experienced writers and designers on our team. Um, but, uh, you know, these kinds of books that I did um, generally, they're produced by art galleries who are trying to promote a specific artist who may be hot at a specific time. So they'll they'll pay for the publishing. Um, the other part of the publishing, you know, books are books are tough. You know, it's a tough business, um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't write it. And uh, so I think again, I think I think the goal really, if you have a book inside you that you want to get written, um, write it, and then 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 sort out the details on the back end. Good advice. Any other questions as we have a few minutes left to discuss? And feel free if you want to unmute and ask your question on or off camera. Um, that's definitely welcome. If you prefer to do it in the chat, that's okay too. But we're equal opportunity questions around for questions around here. Pretty quiet crowd today. Hey, Eric. This is Sheila. Hey, Sheila. Do you think you'll write another book? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with this one. Um, I, I, there may be another book at some point. Uh, I, I kind of, I don't have quite the inspiration to nudge me into one right now. Um, but, but potentially at some point. And that was a common question because Peter asked the same thing just as Sheila was asking hers. I need to know. If there was one thing, or maybe there's a couple of things that you would just do totally different if you were doing this again, what what would that be? What could someone learn from something you feel like you didn't do in the best way? If there is something. Yeah, I uh, so you know, a lot of these kinds of projects, I think, at least for me, it took some maturity and uh, some time to uh, for this. To, I'm not sure looking back that I could have written this as a 28 year old. You know, sometimes you got to have some life experiences to. Uh, to be able to pull together a biography about, you know, an artist and kind of understand the full scope of his life. He died when he was 66 and I'm, I'm 58 now. So I, you know, I've lived um, a similar amount of years that he did. Um, so, so I think, you know, it, if it, if it feels like it's beyond you, it may be beyond you now, but it may not be beyond you later. Um, I think, you know, very ta tactically um, we, when we went to print, we had really had some issues with color and um, and um, getting the print the the paintings in particular to print the way they that that you see them with when you're with those in person. I would have spent a lot more time, I think, um, working on um, getting really great quality digital images at the beginning instead of the back end. Um, that 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 cost us a lot of time um, and. Uh, you know, and I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I never like uh, reading the things that I've written. I'm the biggest critic of, of my writing. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of people on this call that are a lot better writers than I am. Um, and, but I, but I think just getting off dead center and executing is, is, is the biggest lesson I learned in this process. You guys, Eric is incredibly humble because he is one of the best writers I've ever read. Um, but I know we're all very critical of what we do. We did have another question come through. How do you know when you have enough for what you call a book in you? Mm -hmm. How do you know? Well, there's a, there's a, I was watching a, a thing about painting. Um, and um, this painter was talking about, it, it's the, it's the edges of the, of the if of the canvas that make the painting possible. In other words, it's the restrictions of it, you know. And I think a lot of the mistake that a lot of writers make 
is that they just want to keep going, you know? And so you have to put boundaries on the edges of what you're trying to do. And in this book, um, the, the short form essays are just kind of vignettes about Hollis's life. And, it, you know, I didn't want to tell all of his life. I just wanted to give enough impressions, kind of like paintings, so that people just kind of understood him. And that was enough. They didn't know, they didn't even know he bought a, a Dodge truck in 1972. That was, you know, um, that, that would kill a book. So I think it's the boundaries setting, you know, knowing what those boundaries are. We have a saying that we use around here all the time about videos, which is leave them on the bleachers wanting more. Um, the second you give them an audience too much information is the second you lose the audience. And uh, so I just wanted to kind of give enough so that people kind of understood the essence of the guy. And that was plenty. Great answer. We've had three more questions come in. So I'll give you the first one um, from Jennifer. She said, were the photographers open to using their book, their work in your book? And did you credit each photo individually or was there a general credit? How did that work for the photography that was used in the book? When we could, we every photo has a photo buy on it, a photo credit. Um, that was a big job too, trying to figure out some of those older photos who took those. But every every photographer uh, got credit, and and then at the beginning of the book, we kind of have a blanket credit statement with all the photographers, even potential photographers that we couldn't that have may have passed away that we think took the picture. We just included their name um, to give them some acknowledgement. And from Bev, did you create some sort of outline or did you just go? And if you did the outline, did you stick with it or revise as you went? Um, I did not. Uh, well, uh, so Hollis wanted the book to be uh, based on uh, the four sacred directions, kind of four general areas. Um, and th that working from that outline, um, general structure, it's really not an outline. No, I did not write. I, I just wrote until I figured I could covered him so um and then and then you know each one being mindful of of what area i wanted each of those chapters to fit in the book's not terribly chrono chronological either it's it kind of bounces around um and you know I, I wanted anybody to be able to crack open any page and be able to read something and get an impression they don't have to read the whole thing to to get a gain a insight about hollis really and the next question is for Melissa. She asks, did you find as you sat down at different times to write, did your writing change according to your mood? Or did you have the same frame of mind each time since you were writing about the same person's life? Yeah, I, I would say that, uh, you know, getting up at 4 a.m. and writing, I was pretty focused and it didn't didn't deviate too much. The tough part was when, you know, you crack it open a couple of months later and you know, at a different time of day or there's, you know, world different pressures on you on that particular day. You don't like it as much, you know? Um, but, but, uh, but I was pretty much had a lot of momentum behind me for, for those eight or nine days that I was writing and, and it was in the same mood every day. And that was one of the reasons why I'd encourage you, if you do um, want to do this, you know, set aside a specific time of day and a specific block of time to, to do it. It worked really well for me. That leads into another question that we have, you know, obviously you were working on this book while also running a business. You, you didn't completely stop your day job, so to speak, to write a book. Any advice on the time management side for someone who might be considering writing a book as a side gig or a, or a project for a, a freelance client while maintaining another job? Yeah, I was, I was, I, I'm lucky because I've got great people to keep the company going forward. Um, and, um, it, you know, writing this book was kind of my vacation time, I guess, the best way to describe it. Um, yeah, we all got to make a living and that's why I, I encourage you to, you know, write fast, get it to, even if it's messy, get it to a first manuscript to where you think you've got a, a written piece completed. Um, because the the editing and the and the rewriting and that kind of thing, I don't think it requires quite the level of focus that the actual first manuscript does. So, you know, if you got vacation time or time you can take off um, during a slower time of year, that's the best time to do it. Just but but write write write. Don't be afraid of that first sentence. Just go. Absolutely, great advice. Anyone else? We have just a couple minutes left, but could take another question or two if anyone has anything. If not, I'll. 
turn it back over to Eric to see if he has any closing thoughts. Anything you you uh, might not. Bother. What's your, what's your favorite piece of Hollis's work? Do you have one? Yeah. Uh, so he gave me a down payment, a, a painting of a of a herd of bison um, that I have hanging in my house. I've I my God, I if you ever come into my office, I've I have probably thirty five of his works hanging here in my office, and probably a hundred at my house. But the buffalo painting is the most meaningful one, and uh, um, I love that painting. Um, and and I and, and you know, uh, I had never seen the snake priest, which is one of those uh, pretty west winters, until I went back to the museum last January a year ago, and they brought it back up on display. And um, Hollis's work is one of those things that you have to see in person to really appreciate what he was doing. The photos, so photos are great, um, but to be in presence of it, uh, I'd say the Snake Priest would be the second one. Amazing, amazing works. With that, any final parting thoughts, Eric, uh, before we wrap up? Anything you might not have covered in your presentation that you yeah, thought? Yeah, appreciate seeing all the uh, all of my old friends on here. This is awesome. Um, and uh it's uh that's that's the fun part of this and and i think um i have uh the book has resulted in me making a lot of new friends too the people that i never would have known otherwise and um i have that as a slide but it was you know i was just rehearsing it was taking too long to get to 15 minutes so i took it out but but it this process it's not just writing it's about people and it's it's about um, unexpected things coming to your life that are that are good, and uh, that that has been probably the biggest surprise for me. I mean, I have I have people in the art community all the time that I'm talking to, or they're calling me, or that's that's been wonderful because it's it's you know we all love cattle and livestock and and those things, but it's it's nice to break free a little bit too. Um, and experience something new and meet new people that have entirely different perspectives than what than what we have. So, but it's really a, a wonderful thing to see everybody here that I've known for many many years and and send me an email or something. We'll get caught up. Appreciate Absolutely. the opportunity to do this. Absolutely, and thank you so much for your time today, Eric. It was a great presentation. Uh, love the topic that. The, the whole coffee and collaboration committee works really hard. I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but Angie and Jennifer and the whole committee just do a tremendous job um, putting this together month after month and finding great topics and great speakers. And we couldn't do it without them. So grateful for their help, grateful for speakers like Eric, who gave us a little bit of their time and expertise. Very enjoyable. We hope you guys will all join us next month. If you'll watch your email, as, long, uh, as well as uh, Facebook, we will announce when that next coffee and collaboration will be and who the speaker will be. Also hope to see a whole bunch of you at NCBA next week. If there's anything we can do for you, feel free to shoot me or Stacy Fox an email um, at any time. And with that, I'll get you guys off and back to your busy days. But again, just want to say thanks for joining us and hope to see you next time.